Why don't you tell me how you're feeling, Alex? I'm fine. <laughs> I mean, okay, a little depressed, I guess. All right. Any idea why? Probably because I started the apocalypse. Eric has more clarity of conception when it comes to building what he calls the net of a story than any other writer I've ever worked with. He's kind of a rare bird, I think. Eric doesn't like to draw out these long, dramatic questions. He, he, you know, he poses one and he answers it and he moves on to a different one. It's, it's not only a singular vision, but it's, it's really an intelligent, well thought out, and, and, a, and a clear vision. You haven't lived until you're in the writer's room and you're talking about like exactly what God's motivation is in a scene. I'm sorry. A day in the life of Eric Kripke. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, you know, it, uh, I, I would say a typical day at the office for me is is really triage from start to finish. You have to be able to focus on seven different episodes at any given time and keep every detail of every single one totally straight in your head. And I'm just like diving from one room to the other. You know, just le left, you can't imagine just the amount of crap that comes on top of it. And, and what's amazing is you'll be on a phone call yelling, being like some, you know, some Hollywood cliche of a producer. Rah, 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 rah. You tell them they're gonna get rah, 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 rah. You hang up the phone, and then you walk in the room, you're like, okay, let's get creative. You, you just learn to live in the moment. You learn to say, all right, I'm in the room now, and this is the story I'm breaking, so I'm focusing, I'm living in that world. The writing of the show is brutally painful. What are the thematics? What, what are Sam and Dean going through? What's a scary killer to you would like? And then you start talking until you say, oh, that would be a badass scene. And then you write that down on the board. Oh, and that would be a badass scene. Oh, and that would be cool. Oh, and you know, if you do that one, it's gonna lead inevitably to that one. And, and then you start realizing that slowly but surely after about two or three days, scenes are starting to occur to you. I act out every scene, you know, with a massive amount of profanity. His brain is kind of I don't trust it, it's weird. He's really amazing. He can keep more balls in the air than any person I've, I've known and has sort of total recall on what's gone on before and, uh, and has a very clear, clear sense of, uh, of, of what he wants. How that really works inside the writer's room, I mean, I, I would be, well, I'd be lying if I said in season two, we knew we needed to introduce Croatoan because in season five it was gonna be the apocalypse virus they were going to unleash on the world. The side effect, which we laugh about, which we call in the writer's room only half jokingly, is like it has the appearance of intelligence. <laughs> like, we're not actually smart, we just look smart. Had you asked me even as late as season three, like, will, will there be angels in the story? I would have said, no, no, we don't do angels on this show. Um, we had, the way I say it is, we probably had half the mythology figured out. We had the dark half. So we knew that we were gonna go from Yellow Eyes to Lilith to eventually Lucifer and that, you know, in season three, you start to get some of those notions where they talk about Lucifer as, as a kind of their god. There's that one demon who's stuck in the, 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 the girl who's stuck in the basement with Dean and she talks about her belief in Lucifer and she hopes one day he'll return. But we didn't have the angel half. The angel half we figured out on the run. I mean, looking back, it's, it was obvious that you have demons and that there's this whole other side of a coin and we weren't playing it, but you know, hindsight's 2020, and, and thank God it worked out. Hello, Anna. It's good to see you. When you say that, oh yeah, I have a five-year plan, and when you say like, oh yeah, the fifth season, the apocalypse is gonna break out, it's one thing to sort of talk about it. 
Um, it's another thing to do it. And, 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 and then suddenly we, Bob Singer and I, at the beginning of the year, kind of looked at each other and were like, oh sh it's, it's the actual apocalypse. Like we have to, we have to dramatize that. And, and there was a lot of discussion about how do we not bite off more than we can chew? Someone said, you have to um, spread this out into season six. I don't think we would have been able to do it. And if somebody was said, you got to finish it by season four, I don't think we'd be able to do it. It, it, it really seems to have actually fit into a, its proper timeline. We all read Revelation as we kind of got into the season. And, uh, and that's a trippy, trippy uh, story he tells man. There's a very specific order of events, and there's a very, very specific numerology. Uh, it's seven inside of seven inside of seven, and it's kind of amazing that that's a part of a major world religion, because that is, it is bizarre, and it's just this acid trip of a vision. And so, for us, it was just kind of like, okay, can we use a passage from Revelation? Can we use an element from Revelation? To, that people could look up to say, oh, wow, yeah, that's in the book of Revelation, and so therefore we can kind of base an episode on it. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell upon the river, and the name of the star was Wormwood, and many men died. Revelation 8.10. Are you saying that this is about the apocalypse? You could say. For me, the biggest issue wasn't necessarily are we going to wrap up everything, because we, you know, j just by the sheer nature that we knew what was going to happen to Lucifer and Michael, and we were going to reveal who God was, there was never really the worry of can we tie up every single character and every detail. It, it was more about how do we turn that into a satisfying story. Quite frankly, by episode, I don't know, three? We knew they wanted, the angels wanted Dean to say yes to Michael, and that the demons and Lucifer wanted Sam to say yes to the devil. What's hard is, once you drop that bomb, there wasn't that many more bombs to drop. Hello, Dean. What really helped and what really worked was to look at heaven as a family, because this is a show about family, and that you have a rebellious little brother and you have an obedient older brother who's a soldier, and that the obedient older brother does nothing but blindly take orders from his mysterious and absent father, and the little brother tells the absent father and his older brother to go to hell, and literally, you know, literally, and, and takes off out of home and, and feels sort of punished and persecuted from his family as a result. But it, you look back and you're like, it, it, it just, it became what it had to be because of course Michael is Dean, and of course Lucifer is Sam, and of course John is God. It comes out of um, growing up from, with everything from Star Wars to sort of a sophistication in graphic novels and, and, and some, of, some of the universes of those worlds in which the rules and coherency of those worlds became much more important Supernatural isn't just about the story of Sam and Dean, it's about this landscape and this world that they're in and you want the rules to be consistent so it's fun and scary and exciting to go to that world every week. Our writers know, I guess, my strengths and Sam's strengths so well. It's a wonderful thing about having worked so much with, with other people that you just kind of know and they kind of know me and, and I'm proud to go through Sam's journey as much as I can. What's great is the writers, when they see how we're how we're you know, portraying these characters, then they'll start to write to our strengths. And they'll start seeing things that we're doing or ways that we're reacting or, or things that we're you know, um, portraying on, on camera, and they'll start to write to that. So then the character kind of evolves with the help of both the actor and the writers. For me, it's easy, not easy, but it's easy to be passionate about it because, I mean, this was my baby. I mean, this was the show that I wanted to do. This was. This has been the project that by far has been the most satisfying in my career up to this point. Um, this crew and these people are so wonderful and talented and I, I'd be insanely lucky to have a second situation that's been a highlight to the level this is a highlight.
we were all there kind of in the back of his bus going, yeah, go, that's cool, go do that. But he drove it, you know. Yeah, it's a powerful, uh, I think it's a powerful uh, thing he's wrought. This town is, it rewards insanity. It just does. It's, and it's not, it's not good. It's not a good thing, but it is what it is. Pudding! Crazy 